this week about about this round table. We thought instead of just talking about the book and certain chapters that we would try to create or link uh, some of the themes to case studies. And uh, I thought that I would talk about my experience as a administrator coordinator of a TESOL certificate program for many years at uh, York campus. And it was it's a program that uh, fulfills um, a provincial uh, licensing body to teach adult ESL in the kinds of programs that Christine was talking about yesterday. Um, and then, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the ideas that relate to the last chapter in the book that uh, Gray and Block wrote together on the, the marketization and McDonald, that uh, McDonaldization he calls it of uh, using Ritz's term of, um, of the CELTA program of teacher education. So I'm going to make similar kinds of comparisons to what's happened, I think, to TESOL Ontario and the LINK programs in Canada. Um, the title, Teaching For and Against Marketplace Utility, comes from, I borrowed this from a very inspiring, oh, I did, I forget, but it's, it's from D uh, David Corson, who is a brilliant, professor at uh, OISE, passed away 10 years ago. His very last uh, article was published in the first edition of the Journal of Educational Administration. And uh, it was called Teaching for Marketplace Utility. And uh, just, I forgot, I have, don't have this in the right order, but we these are some things we read on this topic a few weeks ago in my course. Um, we, we looked at the Heller article, the Block Brook, uh, the Block Book, Blomert's article on uh, the commoditization of language and accents, especially around um, uh, call center, call centers, which is very interesting. And then something that I've written with Matthew Clark, uh, part of this presentation relates to it. Marnie Halborough's chapter, which much of it uh, gets taken up in the book. And then Park is something that John referred to yesterday around the case study of Korea. So let me go on. I'll show you a quote from David Corson. Um, and it's interesting how this was written by David at a time where we had what was called rhetorically by the government at the time a common sense revolution. And it's interesting what uh, Roberto was saying earlier about how um, the economic system proliferates because it is conceived of as common, uh, natural, emerging out of uh, the genetic propensities, as Adam Smith would say, would to truck, barter, and exchange, and that if left alone, the invisible hand of, um, of people would create the greatest good for the greatest number of people. This was the rhetoric of, of liberalism, the withering of the state, because the state could not provide mm -hmm. for all its citizens. So, Corson, of course, was talking about how this rhetoric of common sense was being uh, kind of uh, just dumped on teachers. And it was around the time where the common sense of greater system-wide standardized tests, increased um, measures for, uh, for proficiency, accountability measures in system were being uh, uh, imposed upon the teaching profession. Now, this idea of the idea that this um, common sense, natural propensity, invisible hand would emerge naturally uh, is still very much part of the contemporary rhetoric that you hear. People say, "Just if the government goes away, we'll supply for all our needs best. Well, one of the great, and actually, Rosalind Gill's husband introduced me to this book. You've probably heard about this one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably my most inspiring professor ever, don't quote me. <laughs> and we read this in the early 80s, and it's an amazing book because he comes to liberalism from the perspective of an anthropologist. He's an economic anthropologist and historian. And one of the interesting things that he talks about the birth of the liberal creed, and they say, fair, this idea of the common sense, letting things emerge, it's a lie. He talked about the double movement. Then, in fact, Lazy fair was enforced, and part of the chapters is of how people on the commons were basically forced into factories. That any kind of non-capitalistic economic activity was crushed. And that the, the idea that people freely went about 
selling their labor on the marketplace is a myth. So one of the great myths of laissez-faire is that it's some kind of genetic predisposition, but it's not. It has always involved what uh, Polanyi called a double movement. And the double movement was this. People in power said, we want less regulation, the rest of us got more. And this is, I think, particularly important when you understand the movement towards uh, the regulation of education. So this kind of irony or double movement of liberalism and neoliberalism still happens. You'll have corporations say, oh, we just, you know, we don't want any more regulations. We don't need those kinds of uh, rules. But then, ironically, you see many fields with no power, like teachers, uh, find our, ourselves having more credentials, more measures. The bureaucracy and the bureaucratization of certain fields has expanded incredibly at the same time the business claims, or Republicans, depending on who you're voting for, or conservatives claim that we need less roles for government. So Polanyi called this the double movement. And I, I'll show you some examples of it. now. Part of bureaucratization um, involved how we regulate production and the role of, of this kind of, I think, Colbert, you talked about rationalization. So one of the things that emerges as another factor in liberalism is increased monitoring and increased techniques of monitoring production processes and divisions of labor that Polanyi also talks about. So at the same time that this idea of laissez-faire and, and freedom of markets, you had this increased fine-tuning measure of systems. In the Block Gray book, they talk about, they refer to Weber's work, they talk about McDonaldization, and McDonaldization is not just the idea that we all start to consume the same products. McDonaldization is also processes of regulating and streamlining production. So this aspect of neoliberalism I want to focus on, and it's part of the book. So it's part of the book, and it also comes from another book that Peter had us read uh, in economic anthropology, and it was. Harry Braverman's Labor Monopoly Capitalism and the idea of Taylorism and scientific management, which I think is a huge, is having a huge effect on education right now and on teacher ed. So the best way I could explain Taylorism and scientific management, um, I could actually relate to what my brother does for a job. He goes into a factory, or he used to do this a little more in the old days, now he's upper management. You go into a factory pulp and paper mill, he'd observe every stage of the process. Time motion studies, this is what they used to do in the factories. Each stage was divided, they would make some way of dividing each stage of the production from input to output and throughput, and they'd decide which elements could be done more efficiently. So first rationalization, this idea of imposing a model, a matrix, then measuring each stage and then deciding at what stages things can be divided and made more efficient, and then use to monitor production and performance. Braverman talks about his move from the factory into fields of knowledge and information. And the, uh, in the last chapter, they talk about this aspect of Taylorism, scientific management, coming into, uh, into education. They use the terms of technocratic reductionist curriculum. Looking at each stage of the curriculum, measuring it, looking at where teachers need to be replaced, or things can be done through digital or through other forms of technology. So these terms, the system, scientific management, is to bring greater efficiencies, calculability, predictability, and control. Um, let me go to the next one. Okay, so I want to now show how some of these processes of Taylorism, scientific management, and some of the things Corson talks about, how they, they've come to define the field of government-funded teacher education over the years. Uh, when I first got into teaching, teacher, uh, this program of six months of funding, well-paid teachers in community colleges, paid vacation pay, uh, uh, paid time off to work on new documents and curricula, that was the norm. But in the 1970s, there's a movement 
towards the 1980s, language instruction became privatized. There was a movement towards, and at the same time, um, privatizing, having people bid on contracts to offer government instruction, coincided with increased requirements to become a teacher. So again, you see the double movement that uh, Pogliani talks about. So freeing up people bid to offer contracts and language instruction. At the same time, greater demands um, for link certification. A BA was required. A highly specified series of modules of instructional uh, training content in terms of hours for SLA, linguistics, hours for um, methodology and practica were all specified. So Tesla Ontario, at the same time is that the competition for jobs and, and very much in a capitalist model, the pool of qualified teachers and higher and higher qualified teachers were coinciding. Uh, and this is kind of where we're at the stage now. It's even worse now. You're finding now master's degrees and TESOL certificates required for any kind of decent paying job in the system in Toronto. And at the same time, uh, the pool of jobs is shrinking. But I want to go to the next point here. Whoops, wrong one. There. Yeah, so what's happened are these shifts. I talked a bit about this yesterday through the system, um, this lower level bias of, of survival English. So most of the students are just doing survival English. Upper level bias is towards increasingly new curricula are job focused. So the, four, the last curricula document, the, most of it is in language for employment. And again, this idea, this construction of the documents for, for learners is that they are, their language abilities are the reason why they might be getting jobs or not. So issues of discrimination, um, racism or discrimination around foreign credentials are never part of the documents. It's always this idea that you are very much in this neoliberal model. You are responsible, your skills are responsible for your success or failure in the system. So I want to get to my next one. Okay. Yeah, so this is interesting too about Tesla Ontario. Um, to get a job, this is an unusual kind of union. You're forced to join Tesla Ontario in order to actually work in their programs. Uh, the other thing is that you have an annual membership fee, but I want to take you now to what I think is an interesting idea of commodification and tailorism, is that not only do you have to annually pay the fee to even begin to look for a job, which you might not get, because you have to actually join Tesla Ontario and pay annual fees, I'd like to show you, uh, yes, what you need to do annually in terms of uh, maintaining your professional certification. And this to me, this is relatively new, it's kind of the epitome of the Tayloristic or the commodification model. And what I find fascinating about this is how somehow they've created what they've determined are equivalencies, all based on time and activities. So again, this, this was unheard of. So it very much falls in this idea of a very technocratic, um, tailoristic model where you are have to perform annually these kinds of tasks that are quantified, placed into a hierarchy, given exchange value. Two hours of this are worth five hours of that, or worth seven hours of that. So you see these kinds of processes of commodification around knowledge and activity to make you qualified to even continue to look for a job that might not be there. And so it's interesting. I mean, I won't go through them all, but you imagine, how did they decide, decide what gets five hours, what gets four hours? Why is this worth more than that? And coincidentally, one last comment about this kind of scientific management of the profession is that if you go and do teacher training in another country like Brazil, as part of your practicum, Tesla Ontario will not recognize that. It doesn't count. Only practice teaching done in Ontario. So this arbitrary creation of scarcity, where there's no value for that, there's no transference of that, it can't possibly be relevant, 
Spring says you must teach or must do your practice teaching these in these kinds of environments. So just very much in the way that Block and Gray talk about these kinds of Tayloristic, arbitrary, imposed systems where knowledge is quantified, teachers are increasingly asked to, to reskill, to raise their credentials at the same time that fewer and fewer jobs with job security are out there. These are kinds of examples, my case study, rather depressing it is. <laughs> Oh, oh, one last quote I could call. The, the idea of governmentality here. Basically, power is less a confrontation than a question of government. This word must be allowed the very broad meaning which it had in the 16th century. Fair time. Government did not refer only to political structures or management states. Rather, it designated the way in which the conduct of individuals or of groups might be directed. The government of children, of souls, of communities, of families, of the sick, and of teachers. It involves modes of action more or less considered and calculated, which were destined to act upon the possibilities of action of other people, to govern in the sense of structure the possible field of action of others. So the quote I like reminds me of the structuring of adult ESL teachers. And I think that's it for me. Thank you.